Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be working an example using our one-dimensional beam element. So to start off, let's actually look at the geometry that we're going to be modeling. And our beam in this case is going to be attached to a wall on the left side, and then subject to a downward force on the right side. And then just to make things a little more interesting, two thirds of the way along the length of the beam, we're going to have a pinned support. Finishing up the geometry, the distance between the wall and the pinned support is going to be two meters. The distance between the pinned support and the end of the beam is going to be one meter. And the last few values we need are the product of E and I, which is going to be 10 kilonewton meters squared in this case. And our force P, which is going to be 1.5 kilonewtons. So our first step with these problems is to split this into the two elements that we're going to use here. So looking at our first element, we can go and label our forces and moments for both sides of this element. So the force on the left, we'll call the shear force on node one, on element one. On the right, it's going to be the shear force on node two of element one. And then the moments will be labeled the same way. For element two, the forces will be similar. Of course, this time we're looking at nodes two and three, and everything is going to be on element two. So this will be V2 on element two and V3 on element two. And again, moments the same way. With that in place, let's go ahead and calculate the product EI over L cubed. For element one, L cubed is eight meters cubed, and so we'll end up with 1.25 kilonewtons per meter. And then for element two, L is only one meter, and so we end up with EI over L cubed being 10 kilonewtons per meter. Now, our next step is to look at the element matrices. So let's start off by looking at our generic element matrix, which can be subdivided into four submatrices. And of course, we're multiplying by E i over L cubed here. Top left submatrix is 12, 6L, 6L, 4L squared. Then top right is negative 12, 6L, negative 6L, 2L squared. The third row is just a negative times the first row. And the last row just swaps the four and the two from the second row. Okay, so now let's go ahead and apply this to each of our elements. So for our first element here, uh, we know this EI over L cubed is 1.25. And I'm gonna drop the units just because they get pretty messy inside the matrix. So we know that we're dealing with kilonewtons here, but I'm not gonna write that anywhere explicitly. So again, we'll go ahead and split this into the four submatrices. L for this case is two. And so we're gonna have 12, 12, 12, four times four is 16. And then negative 12, 12, negative 12, eight. And then we can continue that through. For our second matrix, EI over L cubed is 10. And then all of our L's here are one. So it's pretty simple to copy this over. All right, the big step here is assembling all this. So we're gonna have a large force vector, which is gonna be six elements long. The forces on node one are only the forces from element one. So we're gonna end up with our V1 at one and our M1 on one. For node two, we have contributions from both element one and element two. So we're gonna have our V2 at one plus V2 at two, and then the same for the moments. And then finally for node three, we're back to just having the one contribution. Now we're gonna have a large matrix, which is gonna be six by six, multiplied by our displacement vector. And for this case, our displacements are the vertical displacement V, and the slope or rotation of the node, phi. And we'll split this into nine submatrices. 
Now, the last thing we need to do is unify these two constants out in front of the matrices. So we could shift both of these to 10. And in that case, we'd have to divide each of these by eight, which is kind of a pain. Or since all of these numbers are divisible by four, we can bring out a four from this, shift this to five, and then take out a two and multiply each of our components here by two. So if we have a five out front, looking at this first submatrix here, we're gonna be taking our 12s and 16 and dividing those by four each, because we're taking out a four using distributive property to feed into the 1.25 to get the five. And so this top left submatrix is gonna be three, 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 four. And we can continue that through, and we're gonna do these the top right submatrix here and the bottom left submatrix of our element matrix. So this will be negative three, three, negative three, and this will be a two. And then bottom left will be negative three, negative three, three, and two. Now there's no contribution of one on three or three on one, and so we can zero out both of those. Now looking at our second element matrix over here, we're going to distribute the factor of two in this constant to the entire element matrix. And so this submatrix is going to be negative 24, 12, negative 12, four. And then we can do the same for these two on the bottom. So we get negative 24, negative 12, 12, four, and then 24, negative 12, negative 12, eight. Now I left this middle matrix for last because we need to account for both our matrix here and our matrix here. So let's start with the top left piece of that submatrix. From element one, our contribution is going to be three because we're dividing by four here. From element two, our contribution is 24 because we're multiplying by two. Our total contribution is 27. For the next, we get a negative three plus a positive 12, which ends up being nine. And we have the exact same situation for bottom left. And then finally, we get four plus two times four is eight. So this final number is 12. Creating this matrix was complicated by the fact that we wanted to have nice clean numbers. If we were doing this on a computer, the computer doesn't care if the numbers actually look nice. You just distribute out this 1.25 to the entire matrix and the same with the 10. You add those things together and it looks a little messy, but the computer doesn't care. It's just storing the numbers. Our next step is to look at our forces, see which ones of those we can identify, and our displacements, and see what boundary conditions are applied here. The first thing we can do is look at our node one, which is on that wall. If we're clamped here, which is what we've drawn, then both the position displacement and the rotation displacement have to be zero. We're not allowing it either to move or to rotate. Node two is on our pin joint here. Well, that allows rotation, so we can't set our rotation displacement to zero, but it does not allow any translation. So we can get rid of our V2. And then for our node three, both position and rotation are not defined. And so they could be anything. <clears throat> Looking at our force vector, we can't touch our shear force at the wall. We know that has to be something because the wall imparts some forces uh, and it also imparts some moments. So we can't do anything with those forces now. Same thing with our V21 plus V22. If you sum these together, this is the reaction force from the pin joint. So these two together are the reaction force from the pin. This is our reaction force from the wall. And this is our reaction moment from the wall. So if we want to go back and get those later, we can. Now, there's no actual forces coming from that pin joint. So we can take both of those and set them to zero. For node three, our shear force here is just a negative P. And the moment, again, nothing is applied, and so that's zero. So looking at what we're actually solving, the system of equations that we need to solve come from the displacements that are left. And since we only have three displacements left, we only need to solve this bottom right-hand three-by-three matrix. 
So let's go ahead and write out what that looks like. Our force vector has been reduced to just zero, negative p, zero. And that's gonna be equal to five multiplied by what's in this three by three matrix. So the next step is to go ahead and use a computer to solve this system of equations. And if we do that, we end up with a rotation at node two of negative 0 0.075 radians. For V3, we end up with a displacement of 0 0.125 meters. And then our V3 is negative 0 0.150 radians. So this is our solution, but we can actually go another step further and figure out what these reaction forces and reaction moments are. Let's just look at the reaction force on the pin, which we can solve for using just this third equation. So these first three elements are all multiplied by zero. So we ignore those. We end up with five multiplied by nine times V2 minus 24 times V3 plus 12 times V3. Calculating that out, we end up with a value of 2.625 kilonewtons. So let's go ahead and take these values and just kind of think about them, see if they make sense in our problem up above. We're saying that our rotational displacement at V2 looks something like this. And we have a large uh, vertical displacement at node 3 and an even larger rotational displacement at node 3. And so if we look at the shape of our beam, we should end up with something that looks like this. Is that exactly right? No, but that's probably pretty close. So we should have no vertical displacements and no rotational displacement at node one. We will have no vertical displacement at node two, but we do have a rotational displacement of negative 0.075. Uh, at node three, that rotational displacement is doubled and we have a vertical displacement. Now our force on node two is directed upward, which makes sense because we're pushing down on this right-hand side. We need something to counterbalance that in order to keep the rod up here. So in the end, our calculated values make sense with what intuition tells us should happen with this beam. So that is everything for this video, and I hope that was informative, and I will catch you next time.